Ladies and gentlemen, we will have a few more minutes than we anticipated before the vice president speaks. So we'll restart the plenary until such time that we get the signal that he'll be coming into the chamber. So with that, we'll reconvene this plenary session and I'd ask the foreign minister of Armenia to take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. It is the second time Armenia participates in the ministerial to advance religious freedom hosted by the US Department of State. We view this conference as a great opportunity to collectively identify effective ways and partnerships for better protection and promotion of the freedom of religion or belief. As a strong supporter of the universality of human rights, Armenia promotes adherence to international human rights instruments and firm commitments to ensuring the freedom of religion within the framework of the overall democratization of the society. The nonviolent Velvet Revolution that took place in Armenia in April, May last year, once again demonstrated the powers of tolerance, non-discrimination, and respect for human rights um, and their value in our society. Colleagues, religion represents an institution of identity and the protection of the identity. Our history is a telling story about that. Tolerance and respect to all religions is based on our national experience, Christian heritage, and long history of living together and sharing with other faiths. Freedom of religion and belief is an absolute human right which cannot be abolished or curtailed under any circumstances, inclu including in conflict situations. Protecting religious minorities played a crucial role in establishing modern systems of human rights, which clearly established that grave and massive violations of human rights cannot be considered as a domestic affair, but should, should be of legitimate concern of all members of the international community. Protection of religious groups has been well defined in the crime suppression international instruments, such as the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Preventing mass atrocities against members of religious groups is an absolute priority for Armenia. We know what it means to be a persecuted religious group within the oppressive framework. It is a duty for us to pledge support to all those who are persecuted, including on the basis of their religion and belief today. Armenia became a safe haven for a number of vulnerable religious minorities, particularly Yazidis and the Syrians. Today, Yazidis are the strongest minority group in Armenia. We're very proud that the biggest temple of this ancient people very soon will open in their Armenian homeland. Together with the most ancient Christian churches of the world and magnificent Blue Mosque of Yerevan, it will symbolize beauty of faith and tolerance. Unfortunately, we have been witnessing recurrence of mass atrocities, including acts of genocide against Yazidis and Christians in the Middle East. These persecutions occur in the name of religion, as religion is often misused and abused by those who perpetrate violence or justify it. Attempts to equalize victims and perpetrators by referring to their religious differences is misleading for a simple reason. Perpetrators, unlike the victims, do not represent any religion. And attempts to justify grave crimes, including genocide, by summoning religious solidarity or hiding behind religion is an insult to any religion. The rehabilitation of persecuted communities, the return and restitution of the places of worship, educational and other property are essential components of protection of the freedom of religion. To date, we received more than 20,000 refugees from the Middle East and provide assistance uh, to them on the ground. Armenia stands ready to cooperate with all interested parties to recover ancestral presence of Christians in the Middle East by rebuilding their lives, communities, and churches. The, the Armenian people historically have been significant contributors to diversity, harmony, and prosperity of the countries and societies of the Middle East. This conference provides an excellent platform to initiate partnerships to this end. Colleagues, uh, we uh, welcome this conference and we would welcome this conference to become an annual event. We're convinced that it would amplify opportunities to build up uh, on international consensus and networks for advocacy on religious freedom. The freedom of religion is essential in unleashing potential of any religion as a force striving for peace, harmony, sense of belonging and optimism for the future of humanity. Thank you.
Next, I call on the Foreign Minister of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my great pleasure and privilege to participate in the second ministerial to advance religious freedom. Let me express my sincere gratitude to Secretary Pompeo and Ambassador Brownberg for establishing such an important international forum. Religious tolerance and cultural diversity have defined our way of life and remain inherent part of our national identity. For centuries, Georgia has been and remains a special place where various ethnic and religious minorities live peacefully and worship freely side by side. They have been actively engaged in the public life since the very outset of the Georgian democracy and were represented in the Georgian Constituent Assembly 100 years ago. Today, the culture of diversity deeply rooted in our history and society plays an essential role in Georgia's democratic and economic development, as well as advancing our European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations. Needless to say, our constitution enshrines absolute freedom of religion and equality for all. Our national human rights strategy and action plan translates these provisions into concrete policy and action. We alleviate religious freedom up to the high governmental level. The State Agency for Religious Issues operates under the Prime Minister's umbrella. Since 2018, the working group formed in the Parliament of Georgia holds regular meetings with uh, participation of all key stakeholders in order to identify challenges and outline the way forward. Since 2014, various religious organizations have continued to receive financial compensation for damages inflicted during the Soviet period as, a, well, as, uh, as well as uh, subsidized for restoration of uh, religious properties. We also continue to return the Soviet era appropriate, appropriated property to religious minorities. While the government of Georgia provides all kinds of benefits and assistance to various religious uh, denominations, two Georgian regions occupied by Russia are still deprived of any such benefits. As a result of 2008 invasion of Georgia and subsequent occupation, those regions became black spots of human rights violations. For more than a decade, the Georgian parish and Orthodox clergy have not been allowed to enter the occupied territories for religious services and ethnic Georgians living in these areas are deprived of their right to celebrate religious holidays or attend services in their native language. Access to churches and cemeteries in the occupied territories is restricted due to barbed wire fences and artificial barriers installed by the occupation regime along the dividing lines. Those who try to visit are running the risk of detention by the so-called border guards. Moreover, a significant number of Georgian Orthodox churches and monasteries in the occupied territories are either destroyed or at risk of, of irreversible damage aimed at uh, uh, obliterating any association with Georgian history and religious identity. The situation is even more alarming provided that international organizations do not have access to the occupied regions of Georgia. Georgia remains firmly committed to the peaceful conflict resolution and unilaterally undertakes all efforts to move forward in this regard. I take this opportunity to ask the international community to once again send a strong signal that its policy directed against the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Georgia is unacceptable. Ladies and gentlemen, we see religious freedom being challenged in many places all over the world. Regrettably, some parties try to justify extremism and terrorism through different interpretation of religion. To meet those challenges, we need to join efforts and work together. Georgia has been successfully undertaking the role of mediator among various cultures, and we are willing to continue our active engagement in bringing different religious communities. Thank you. Now I call on the Foreign Minister of Bangladesh. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. At the outset, I would like to thank Secretary Pompeo for inviting me to participate in this Religious Freedom Conference. As we gather here today, we send a reassuring message of protecting and promoting religious freedom. We recognize that millions of people around the globe are degraded, demonized, and persecuted because of their religious orientation. Thus, we stand proudly today 
with USA to ensure that people of any belief can live a life with human dignity and free from any fear of persecution or hatred. Today, we rejoice the spirit of humanity, peace and inclusiveness, and promise to preserve the right to live a life in ways of one's own liking. It's indeed a great honor to represent a country which is known for religious tolerance and harmony for ages. A country which was founded on secular ideals with a promise to ensuring equal rights for all people regardless of their faith and a country which is a beacon of religious pluralism, harmony and freedom. Inspired by the ideals of democracy, secularism, and social justice, and led by the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujir Rahman, we established a country committed to ensuring equal rights to the members of all faiths and religions. The inedible right of freedom of religion is guaranteed in our constitution. Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is an ardent advocate of religious freedom, and she has been actively promoting secularism, non-communalism, and peaceful coexistence of all. Her government also maintains a zero-tolerance approach to any form of violence and discrimination against religious minorities under any pretext. The government believes that radical views and extreme interpretations of religious scriptures are no longer confined to a particular religion or group. It considers terrorists are as simply terrorists, regardless of their faith, ethnicity, color, or caste. Prime Minister Hasina has been promoting a national slogan, and I quote, religion unto individual, festival unto all, to promote religious tolerance and create a sense of accommodation among religious sects. Now members of all religious communities are celebrating their religious festivals with enthusiasm and fervor. And the government has been providing support to this end. Among others, a new law has been enacted to prevent provocation, incitement, and hate speech against any religion to maintain communal harmony, social cohesion, and peaceful existence. Bangladesh is a land of humanity. When Rohingyas were subjected to genocidal atrocities in Myanmar and crossed over to Bangladesh to save their lives, Bangladesh provided shelter to them regardless of their faith and dealt with the situation in humane and, and humanitarian ways. Currently, Bangladesh is hosting more than 1.1 million of Rohingyas. Bangladesh appreciates the continuous support of international communities, including the US, uh, to address the issue. Media and use of modern technology are two important tools for promoting religious freedom in present day world. Unfortunately, we often see that both the tools are adversely used to stifle religious freedom. Media is often seen to propagate hate and intolerance that threatens peace and stability and create any of us division among different religious sects. Thus, we would like to see media to play a constructive role in promoting religious freedom, thereby supporting peace and stability. Ladies and gentlemen, if we would like to have sustainable peace and stability across nations, it is imperative to inculcate a mindset of tolerance, a mindset of respect for others, irrespective of religion, ethnicity, color, and background. Government alone cannot create such a mindset of tolerance. However, if community leaders and leaders of synagogues, churches, mosques, mandirs, academia, parents, scholars, opinion builders, talk show hosts, civil society, work together in collaboration and in partnership, we are sure to achieve our goals. Let me hope that this ministerial would contribute significantly to advancing culture of tolerance and mutual respect among different religions and races. As I conclude here, I propose to host a ministerial at regional level in Bangladesh soon. Uh, Allah bless you all. I thank you all. Joy Bangla. Joy Bangabandhu. Thank you, sir. We'll now pause the plenary session and soon the vice president will speak. One point of order, uh, the Senegalese foreign minister is having travel difficulties. So after the vice president speaks, we'll hear from foreign minister Katz.
We're good.
Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back the Honorable Sam Brownback, Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. Thank you all. I'm so grateful to our next keynote speaker and my friend, Vice President Mike Pence, for joining us today. The Vice President's career has been marked by a commitment to religious freedom and fighting for faith. He is a driving force behind this administration's making religious freedom a foreign policy priority. Born in Columbus, Indiana, and went to both undergraduate and law school in that state. Afterwards, he practiced law, hosted a radio and television program in Indiana, then felt a call for public service. He ran and won his local congressional district to represent his community. In Congress, he was elected Indiana's 50th governor later in 2013 and would join the then Trump ticket as his running mate in July of 2016. We're grateful he's now serving as the 48th Vice President of the United States and that he is with us today. Please welcome the Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence. Well, Ambassador Brownback, Your Excellencies, and to all of those who have struggled under religious persecution, you honor us by your presence all. Welcome. Welcome to the second ministerial to advance religious freedom, and welcome to the largest human rights ministerial ever held at the United States State Department. We gather today as people who believe in freedom of religion and also the power of faith. As Vice President of the United States, I stand for the freedom of religion that animated the American founding and is enshrined in our Bill of Rights. But this is a special day for me as well because on a personal level, my faith in Jesus Christ has brought meaning and purpose to me and my family every day of my life. So I'm honored by your presence, and I'm especially honored to address you today as Vice President to an American President who has been a great champion of religious freedom at home and abroad. So allow me to begin by bringing greetings and welcome on behalf of the 45th President of the United States of America, President Donald Trump. Since the earliest days of our nation, America has stood for religious freedom. Our first settlers left their homes and all they knew for the chance to, as they said, begin the world all over again. They carved protections for religious liberty into the founding charters of our nation and our very earliest laws. And after our independence was won, the crafters of America's constitution enshrined religious liberty as the first of our American freedoms. Our Declaration of Independence proclaims that our precious liberties are not the gift of government, but rather they're the unalienable rights endowed by our Creator. Americans believe that people should live by the dictates of their conscience, not the dictates of government. We're proud, proud that our long tradition of inspiring other nations to embrace religious freedom and respect for human rights has ushered in important improvements in the lives of people all over the world. And I want to take this opportunity to thank, to thank the distinguished representatives of the 106 countries who have chosen to be here today to join us in taking a strong stand in defense of religious freedom. Free minds build free markets. And wherever religious liberty is allowed to take root, it is prosperity and peace that ultimately flourish as well. As we tell even our closest allies, those who reject religious freedom are more likely to breed radicalism and resentment. It can sow the seeds of violence, and it can too often cross borders. 
And those who deny religious freedom to their own people often have few qualms denying those rights to others. That's why under President Trump's leadership, this administration has taken decisive action to defend our first freedom at home and abroad. The president made a bold statement in support of religious liberty when he appointed a friend and a lifelong champion of our first freedom as our ambassador at large for international religious freedom. And that man has now traveled the world and his good work is evidence in the historic turnout today. Would you all join me in recognizing and thanking Ambassador Sam Brownback for his work on behalf of religious liberty around the world. Thank you, Sam. And earlier this year, our administration built on that progress by appointing Elon Carr as a special envoy for monitoring and combating anti-Semitism. And earlier today, as you all heard, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced a new initiative to create a forum for dialogue about religious liberty around the world. And we look forward to working with each of you in the newly instituted International Religious Freedom Alliance. And with this renewed focus on religious liberty, we've stood with those who are oppressed for their religious beliefs around the world since the first days of this administration. Three years ago, an American pastor was arrested in Turkey and imprisoned for the alleged crime of dividing and separating the nation, simply by spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. In one meeting after another with President Erdogan, I saw President Trump demand the release of this good man of faith. Through two years of imprisonment, we stood strong. And in October of last year, through the president's efforts and by God's great kindness, Pastor Andrew Brunson came home. Pastor Brunson's story of perseverance in the face of incredible hardship was an inspiration to people across our country and believers around the world. And we express our admiration to him from the bottom of our hearts, being an example of faith that is like gold tested in fire. I understand he is with us today. He is my friend. So let me just say, Pastor Brunson, welcome home. It is good to be back with you for the second year in a row. Last year, it was my great honor to address the first ministerial, where I announced two initiatives that I'm proud to report have made great progress. We announced a new initiative to ensure that religious freedom and religious pluralism would prosper across the Middle East, the Genocide Recovery and Persecution Response Program. And to date, I'm proud to report the United States has provided more than $340 million in aid to faith and ethnic minority communities persecuted by ISIS in Iraq and throughout the region. Second, at that ministerial, we announced a new initiative to support those who fight for religious freedom and those who suffer from religious persecution, the International Religious Freedom Fund. And since then, we've received nearly $5 million in pledges with donors from several countries well represented here. With your support, We've provided more than 435 rapid response grants to those persecuted because of their beliefs, helping more than 1,800 people directly as well as their families and fellow believers. For example, in Sri Lanka, we've given much needed assistance to the victims of the Easter Sunday attacks. And as I said last year, America is proud to lead this program. But we ask all the nations gathered here and around the world to join us in this important fund. Together we will champion the cause of liberty as never before. And I believe that our combined leadership will make a difference for religious liberty for generations to come. So we've made progress, but we still have much work to do. For as we gather here today, a stunning 83% of the world's population live in nations where religious freedom is threatened or even banned. The victims of religious persecution face economic sanctions. They're often arrested and imprisoned. They're the target of mob violence and state-sanctioned terror. And all too often, 
Those whose beliefs run counter to their rulers face not just persecution, but death. The list of religious freedom violators is long. Their oppressions span the globe. Here in our hemisphere, in Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega and his vice president and wife, Rosari, Rosario Murillo, continue their assault on faith and human rights. Their regime violently suppresses dissent, assaults opponents, and condones thugs who repress and intimidate Catholic church leaders for defending democracy and religious freedom. In Venezuela, the dictator Nicolas Maduro is using his so-called anti-hate laws to prosecute Catholic clergy who speak out against his brutal regime that has impoverished millions in this once prosperous country. Jewish community leaders report that Media associated with the Maduro regime often cast coverage of Israel in anti-Semitic tones and trivialize or even deny the Holocaust. Nicolas Maduro has brought nothing but misery to the people of Venezuela. Nicolas Maduro is a dictator with no legitimate claim to power. And Nicolas Maduro must go. At President Trump's direction, the United States was proud to be the first nation on earth to recognize interim President Juan Guaido as the legitimate president of Venezuela. And since then, we're grateful that more than 50 nations have joined us in this cause, including Greece, just last week, which became the 55th nation to recognize interim president Juan Guaido. So we're standing strong for free and democratic Venezuela. We're also calling out the persecution of religious minorities in the greatest state sponsor of terrorism in the world, the Islamic Republic of Iran. The Iranian people enjoy few, if any, freedoms, least of all the freedom of religion. Christians, Jews, Sunnis, Baha'is, and other religious minorities are denied the most basic rights enjoyed by the Shia majority. And believers are routinely fined, flogged, and arrested in Iran. Like a story of a courageous Christian pastor whose daughter is here with us today. In 2009, Iranian authorities shut down a pastor, Victor Bet Tam Raz's church. But instead of fleeing the country, he continued to share the good news. In 2017, the Iranian government sentenced him to 10 years in prison. And in 2018, they sentenced his wife to five years and later charged their couple's son to four months in prison for spreading Christian propaganda. Pastor Bet Tam Raz and his family are an inspiration to freedom-loving people the world over. And we couldn't be more honored to have his daughter, Tabrina, here with us today. Please join me in recognizing Tabrina Bet Tam Raz. Of course, Iran's leaders aren't content to persecute only their own people. They routinely export violence and terrorism throughout the region, including to their neighbors in Iraq. To this day, Iranian-backed militias extort and terrorize the people of the Nineveh Plain, which is still recovering from the days of ISIS' brutal reign. Now, let me be clear. The United States will not stand idly by while Iranian-backed militias spread terror. And today, I'm announcing that the United States has placed sanctions on two leaders of Iranian-backed militias for all they've done. We will hold them accountable. But the people of the United States of America have a message to the long-suffering people of Iran. Even as we stand strong against the leaders in Tehran, Know that we are with you. We pray for you. And we urge you to press on with courage in the cause of freedom and a peaceful and prosperous future for your people. So we're standing up to the regime in Tehran. We're also standing up for the persecuted Rohingya people in Burma. 
While that conflict has fallen along ethnic lines, we cannot ignore the rise of militant Buddhism against Muslim and Christian minorities that's taken place. A brutal campaign of ethnic cleansing against the Rohingya has forced more than 700,000 to flee across the border to Bangladesh. And though the United States has repeatedly urged the Burmese government to hold accountable all those responsible, the government has continued to imprison and harass innocent men and women. Like a young Rohingya woman who's here with us today, when she was just 18 years old, she was thrown in jail for the simple crime of being the daughter of a political activist who dared to challenge the old military regime. For seven years, she and her family endured deplorable conditions, but they never lost faith in the freedom that was their birthright. Eventually, she was released, and since then, she's gone on to earn a law degree and a master's of laws from the University of California, Berkeley. Now she's a leading advocate of empowering women and girls all over the world. She's an inspiring woman, and we're honored to have her with us today. Join me in recognizing Wei Wei Nu. Thank you for your example and your leadership. The United States has urged the Burmese government to hold accountable those responsible and make it clear that these mass atrocities must never happen again. But so far, our words of admonition have seemed to fall on deaf ears. And that's why this week, the United States of America placed visa sanctions on Burma's top two military leaders, the commander-in-chief and his deputy, as well as two commanders of light infantry brigades. We will hold them accountable. So we're standing up to the malign regime in Iran and pressing for accountability in Burma. But the United States has also spoken out against religious persecution in the People's Republic of China. And we do so again today. China's oppression of Tibetan Buddhists goes back decades. As part of its efforts to oppress Tibetan Buddhism back in 1995, Chinese authorities captured the legitimate Panchen Lama, then just a six-year-old boy, and neither he nor his family have been heard from in the 24 years since. In Xinjiang, the Communist Party has imprisoned more than a million Chinese Muslims, including Uyghurs, in internment camps, where they endure round-the-clock brainwashing. Survivors of the camps have described their experiences as a deliberate attempt by Beijing to strangle Uyghur culture and stamp out the Muslim faith. Religious persecution in China has also targeted the Christian faith. But in one of the greatest ironies in the history of Christianity, in today's communist China, we actually see the fastest growth in the Christian faith that we have ever seen anywhere on earth in the last 2,000 years. Just 70 years ago, when the Communist Party took power, there were fewer than a half a million Chinese Christians. Yet today, just two generations later, faith in Jesus Christ has reached as many as 130 million Chinese Christians. The truth is, faith is breaking out all across China, even in the streets of Hong Kong. As the pro-democracy activist Jimmy Lai told me earlier this month, when young people encounter police in the streets during protest marches that have drawn millions, he said those young people often sing songs of worship and praise. As he said, they sing, Alleluia to the Lord. Chinese authorities may ban the sale of Christian Bibles, but that hasn't stopped China from publishing more Christian Bibles than any country on earth. Chinese authorities may ban the construction of Christian churches, but that hasn't prevented China from building more Christian churches than any other country in the world. China's experience is just more evidence of a time-worn truth. The pathway through persecution lies in the faith and resilience of the persecuted. 
like that of a pastor of a large unregistered church in Guangzhou, China. On December 9th, 2015, Pastor Su Tianfu was placed under house arrest after Chinese law enforcement raided the Livingstone Church. Later, he and his fellow co-pastor were charged a fine of up to a million dollars for collecting illegal donations from their church parishioners. And just last year, he was sentenced to one year in prison. His courage in the face of such relentless persecution is an inspiration to freedom-loving people all over the world. And we're honored to have with us today his courageous wife, who's been with him every step of the way. So join me in recognizing Manping Ouyang. We are honored that you are with us today, and we are inspired by your faith. Mm -hmm. The United States is engaged in ongoing negotiations and discussions over our trading relationship with China, and those will continue. But whatever comes of our negotiations with Beijing, you can be assured the American people will stand in solidarity with the people of all faiths in the People's Republic of China. And we will pray for the day that they can live out their faith freely without fear of persecution. But for all the challenges that believers face in China, the treatment of people of faith in North Korea is much worse. As the United Nations Commission on Human Rights reported, and I quote, the violations of human rights in the DPRK constitute crimes against humanity, the gravity, scale, and nature of which has no parallel in the contemporary world. Open Doors has identified North Korea as the world's worst persecutor of Christians for the past 18 years. The North Korean regime formally demands that its officials act to, in their words, wipe out the seed of Christian reactionaries. And possession of a Bible is a capital offense. So you can be confident. As President Trump continues to pursue the denuclearization of North Korea and a lasting peace, the United States will continue to stand for the freedom of religion of all people of all faiths on the Korean Peninsula. The United States stands with all victims of religious persecution. And the American people have them in our hearts and in our prayers. Whether it be North Korea, China, Burma, Iran, or all around the world. But today I'd like to draw your attention to four men who have faced down enormous pressure to stay true to their faith. And whose release, even now, after long captivity, would help restore the reputation of the countries that have detained them. In Eritrea, the 90-year-old patriarch of the Orthodox Church, Abuna Antonius, continues an already 12-year-long house arrest because he refuses to excommunicate critics of the government in his church. In Mauritania, the blogger Mohammed Sheikh Moherti is still being held for criticizing the government's use of Islam to justify discrimination. In Pakistan, Professor Junaid Hafiz remains in solitary confinement on unsubstantiated charges of blasphemy. And in Saudi Arabia, blogger Raif Badawi is still in prison for the alleged crime of criticizing Islam through electronic means. All four of these men have stood in defense of religious liberty, the exercise of their faith, despite unimaginable pressure. And the American people stand with them. And so today, the United States of America calls upon the governments of Eritrea, Mauritania, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia 
to respect the rights of conscience of these men and let these men go. While religious freedom is always in danger in authoritarian regimes, threats to religious minorities sadly are not confined to autocracies or dictatorships. The truth is they can and do arise in free societies as well, not from government persecution, but from prejudice. In Europe, where religious freedom was born as a principle and is enshrined in law, anti-Semitism is on the rise. In France and Germany, things have gotten so bad that Jewish religious leaders have warned their followers not to wear kippahs in public for fear that they could be violently attacked. And attacks on Jews, even on aged Holocaust survivors, are growing at an alarming rate. Regrettably, the world's oldest hatred has even found a voice in the halls of our United States Congress. So let me say clearly, anti-Semitism is not just wrong, it's evil. And anti-Semitism must be confronted and denounced wherever and whenever it arises, and it must be universally condemned. I met just this last week with Rabbi Yisrael Goldstein from Shabbat of Poway, the California synagogue that was the scene of a tragic shooting in April of this year. He was still wearing the bandage from a wound that he suffered during the attack. His courage was incredible. And while I was there, I also met the hero who chased the assailant out of the synagogue. And meeting him only confirmed in me an old truth that faith inspires heroes. That's why faith always triumphs. But to all the victims of persecution who are here with us today, know this, the American people are with you. We are with you. The people of the United States are inspired by your testimony and by your strength. And it steals our resolve to stand for religious liberty in the years ahead. The American people will always cherish religious freedom. And we will always stand with people across the world who take a stand for their faith. We've gathered here 106 nations strong because we believe in the freedom of conscience. The right of all people to live out their lives according to their deeply held religious beliefs. We're here today because we are and will forever remain dedicated to the principle that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. And among them are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. These are not the birthright of Americans. They, they're the birthright of the human race. And I promise you, under this president, We'll always respect the sovereignty and diverse cultures of every nation in the world. But as we do, America will continue to aspire to be that city on a hill that John Winthrop wrote about so long ago. We'll always continue to stand for the freedom to live, to work, and worship according to the dictates of your conscience. And freedom of religion will always be an American anthem. And so today, I thank you for being present here today. For the many nations represented here and for your solidarity with us and your determination in your nations to advance the cause of religious liberty. I leave here today with renewed confidence as I see all of you. And properly, I close with faith. Faith that we will make progress on behalf of religious liberty in the years ahead. You know, inscribed on the Liberty Bell, which was given to the United States of America by France shortly after 
we want our independence, our ancient words. It reads, proclaim liberty throughout all the land and unto all the inhabitants thereof. Americans and liberty-loving people throughout the world and throughout our history have done this. And I believe with all my heart that as each of us in all the nations represented here renews our commitment to proclaim liberty throughout all our lands, that all faiths and freedom itself will flourish. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. So thank you all. Thank you for your stand. May God bless all who yearn for freedom and labor beneath persecution for their faith. May God bless all your nations. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. Our program will resume shortly. I'd like to reconvene the plenary session so we can keep moving down the list of speakers. People may want to find a new seat. We'll be restarting the plenary session now. With that, I'd like to ask the Foreign Minister of Israel to take the floor. I can have everyone's attention. We're getting started. Foreign Minister of Israel has the floor. I would like to thank U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Ambassador Sam Brownback, and the Department of State for organizing this important gathering. There are over 80 Christian countries and over 50 Muslim countries in the world but my country, Israel, is the only Jewish state, and I'm proud to be here as Israel's foreign minister discussing freedom of religion. In Israel and in our capital, Jerusalem, Christians, Muslims, Jews, and people of every other faith are free to practice their religion. For the first time in 2,000 years, the holy places of all are protected. Our nearly 2 million Muslim citizens and our growing Christian population can celebrate their faith as they wish. As the Jewish state, we also have a special connections to all Jews. It is why we are worried about the alarming rise of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semites will always find a reason to hate the Jewish people. In some places in Europe, Jews are once again worried about their future. The world is also facing the freight of radical Islamist extremism, such as Daesh and Al-Qaeda, and the radicalism of Iran and its proxies, Hezbollah and other terror organizations. 
In Gaza, the terrorist organization Hamas are holding two Israeli citizens and the bodies of two Israeli soldiers, Hadar Goldin and Doron Shaul, I call on all religious leaders to pressure Hamas to return them immediately to their families. The Iranian regime denies the Holocaust and threatens to destroy my country, Israel. As the son of Holocaust survivors, I am only too aware that when anti-Semitism and religious extremism rise, the whole world becomes a darker and more dangerous place. Yet religious can also offer hope. The Abrahamic faiths with other religious and religious leaders can use our common values and their influence to build a bridge between peoples and cultures and find solutions to conflict and troubles. Religion should unify us, not divide us. It is my hope that this will be the true role of religion in our region and all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I give the floor to the Foreign Minister of Greece. Um, actually, I am the Undersecretary for Political Affairs, and uh, on behalf of the Greek Foreign Minister, Dendias, who unfortunately had to leave, I would like to address this conference on the issue of religious freedom. First of all, I would like to commend the United States of America Department of State and especially the Secretary of State, Mr. Pompeo, for organizing for a second year a ministerial conference on such a hugely important issue as combating religious persecution and discrimination and ensuring greater respect for religious freedom for all. A global increase in restrictions on freedom of religion or belief is one of the major plights of our times. A climate of intolerance and violent fanaticism in the name of religion is on the rise. Violations or abuses of freedom of religion or belief committed both by state and non-state actors are widespread and affect people in all parts of the world. A large part of humanity experiences limitations on its right to enjoy freedom of religion or belief. Members of religious communities face grave human rights violations, which on many occasions are so brutal that amount to war crimes. In a number of regions, various actors, especially armed groups, continue to engage in violence, atrocities, and hate crimes against religious communities and their historical places of worship, exacerbating intolerance. Opposing and warding off any kind of religious intolerance and fanaticism is a central tenet of Greece's both internal and foreign policy. Greece is convinced that it is a complete perversion of the true meaning of religion to use religious faith in order to divide people and stir up hatred. On the contrary, religious faith can and should be considered as a way to build bridges, to establish relations, to develop trust, <clears throat> and to work towards the common goal of sustainable peace and development. We strongly believe that the interfaith dialogue between states, religious leaders, and civil society is a means of promoting concrete ways to counter contemporary challenges to the right to freedom of religion or belief. Greece, in order to support and protect the individual right to religious freedom, has established a particular mechanism for collecting, evaluating, and, pub and publishing data on incidents of vandalism and desecration of religious sites of all religious communities. In addition, since 2014, a comprehensive anti-racism law has been in place defining acts of religious fanaticism and intolerance as a criminal offense. 
It is in the spirit of attaching particular importance to the concept of international and regional protection of religious freedom that Greece, as a solid pillar of stability in the Mediterranean region, has taken initiatives seeking to promote peaceful coexistence in the Middle East, most notably by organizing in Athens in 2015 and 2017 two conferences on religious and cultural pluralism in the Middle East. These conferences brought together 168 political leaders and representatives from 38 countries, international organizations and religious leaders, academics and representatives of NGOs. <clears throat> As a follow-up to the first Athens conference, the Center for Religious Pluralism in the Middle East was established and tasked with codifying the various problems in terms of freedom of religion and cultural pluralism and elaborating on concrete proposals and viable solutions. The Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople and the other ancient Orthodox Christian sees of the East, having cohabited for centuries with Islam and Judaism, tend as stable pillars of peaceful coexistence and fundamental factors of stability and appeasement. The Christian Orthodox Church has proven for centuries that by being open and tolerant, it can promote in deeds and not only in words, the human dignity and mutual respect which are the foundations of coexistence. Culture and religion should not turn into obedience tools in the vision of any power. Every religion is an integral part of the global re reality and must promote and defend coexistence between distinct concepts as they are reflected in different cultures. In concluding, I would like to once more underline that religious coexistence, tolerance, pluralism, and interfaith dialogue can contribute to combating religious persecution and discrimination, and thus ensure religious freedom for all, a common target that the international community should be absolutely committed to. Thank you very much. Now I call upon Jordan. In the name of God. Excellencies, peace be upon you, and uh, I would like to, in, the, in my name and the name of the delegation of the Hashemayat Kingdom, to thank the Vice President, the Secretary, and Ambassador Brownback for this ministerial that has great importance. And I would like to say that Jordan, with the oldest uh, Christian community in the world, and where Muslims and Christians coexist since 1400 years, and in modern Jordan, when we started as a state of law, our constitution mandates coexistence regardless of religion, sect, and on its 14th article calls on the state to protect the, religion, the freedom of religion. The Constitution also calls for establishing religious courts for Muslims and different courts for non-Muslims. And based on the Quran and the cultural principles that call for plurality and freedom of religion and uh, forbids coercion, Jordan was aware of the importance of differences and not using it as a method of divisiveness in the region or the world. And so under the leadership of His uh, uh, Highness, King Abdullah put together the mes message of Amman in 2004 calling for respect of uh, plurality and diversity and preventing persecution for religion or, sector, or sectarian uh, leanings. And on these principles, it became part of the International Jurisprudence Center in Amman as a reference for all Muslims. Under that, it also launched the initiative for one word uh, between Christians and Muslims and the International Week of Coexistence under King Abdullah on the 20th of October 2010 and marking the first two week of February every year a week of coexistence amongst all religions in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, these initiatives in the Islamic world and in the region had a very positive impact 
and uh, uh, expanded awareness against all extremist ideas, and it was a reason to launch this course within Jordan and outside Jordan. This dialogue is based on uh, respecting human rights and preserving dignity. For example, the Amman message and its principles are now the basis of are holding more than 30 uh, conferences where imams and religious leaders meet in different uh, Muslim countries where they conduct dialogue that shows respect for diversity and coexistence and a positive interaction. These meetings are held more than once a year and are the uh, uh, Ministry of Islamic Affairs within the kingdom and outside the kingdom. Additionally, um, celebrating the week of coexistence is, a, is now a platform that communities use to show the respect for freedom, dignity, and dignity. Uh, additionally, these uh, forums are now part of the curric uh, educational curriculum to promote the, uh, the diverse culture, Jordan, with its coexistence and harmony, made the kingdom under the leadership of King Abdullah uh, into a, a host of all those who flee persecution under the uh, conflicts in the region, current conflicts in the region, and the conditions of Christians, Muslims, Yazidis, and other followers of other sects who sought refuge in Jordan are the best example of that. We should not forget that uh, this approach and these initiatives are the basis of uh, an international coalition against hatred and extremism, regardless of its source, and all the attempts that try to employ religion to, uh, uh, to stoke conflict and to desecrate the holy sites and um, under the leadership of King Abdullah, we will stand fast under our call for the coexistence among us religions, cultures, and religions. And with that, uh, we also are sincere and uh, uh, true to our cultural roots. And we thank you for your noble invitation and, and maybe be upon you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now give the floor to the European Union. Uh, excellencies and friends, I wish to thank Vice President Pence and uh, Secretary Pompeo, as well as Ambassador at Large Brownback, for the honour to speak here and for the organisation of today's ministerial. Uh, I am representing the High Representative and Vice President of the European Union, Federica Mogherini, who has asked me to express the European Union's support for this important event. Last year, the first Ministerial on Religious Freedom coincided with the 70th anniversary uh, of the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Universal Declaration, as we all know, and we have all committed to, includes the critical right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion in Article 18. Unfortunately, since this initiative was launched last year, the world has witnessed more and more violations of fundamental principles, many of which have been highlighted over the last two days by faith actors, victims of religious persecution, and human rights defenders. Extremist attacks in Christchurch, Pittsburgh, and Sri Lanka, and the terrible consequences of the spreading of hate speech and hate crime against people belonging to religious groups. The right to religious freedom is enshrined in Article 10 of the European Union's Charter of Fundamental Rights. Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights commits to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. The European Union has a strong legislative framework that ensures that freedom of thought, conscience, religion, and belief is underpinned by domestic legislation in all our 28 member states. We have effective laws against discrimination, racism, xenophobia, and incitement to violence and hatred, including on religious grounds. The European Union has a fundamental rights agency which closely monitors how persons belonging to religious groups, and in particular Jews and Muslims, 
face discrimination, hate speech and hate crime within the European Union. And together with the European Commission, we ensure that these issues are addressed at a national level. Freedom of religion and belief is one of the priorities of the European Union's human rights policy. In 2013, we adopted guidelines on the promotion and protection of freedom of religion and belief. The European Union appointed a special envoy for freedom of religion and belief, Jan Fiegel, whom I have the honour to have joined me here today. It, the freedom of religion or belief is part of my work as the European Union Special Representative for Human Rights and is a constant focus of our engagement with all our partners. For instance, during the last 12 months, we have raised strong concerns at freedom of religion or, um, re freedom of religion or belief violations in more than 20 human rights dialogues with countries across the Middle East and North Africa, South, Central, East and Southeast Asia. Our message is always clear and consistent in all parts of the world and with all partners, no matter their wealth or perceived geopolitical importance. Governments and political leaders have a duty to guarantee freedom of religion and belief, and they may not use national security, counter-terrorism or cultural arguments to trade off or to undermine it. We also stress the need to avoid the politicisation of these rights or the prioritisation of some rights over others. Freedom of religion or belief should be part of a broad effort to promote and adhere to non-discrimination priorities and should, be, should not be separated from the protection of all other human rights. Beyond local and regional situations, the work for human rights is and must be a global effort. The European Union believes that the United Nations is the principal forum to advance and protect human rights, including freedom of religion and belief. The Human Rights Council in Geneva and the General Assembly Third Committee in New York are pivotal in our collective efforts to promote freedom of religion and belief. The European Union has led a strong resolution specifically on freedom of religion and belief in the Human Rights Council and the UNGA Third Committee. We work closely with the Organization of Islamic Cooperation on their twin resolution on combating intolerance and ensure complementarity of both resolutions. Last March, the European Union led the FORB resolution at the Human Rights Council, which renewed the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on FORB for a further three years. We consider fundamental the work of the UN Special Procedures to monitor human rights violations around the world. The establishment in 2019 of an International Day Against Religious Persecution represents a good opportunity for all of us to publicly show our commitment to tackling violence against believers and non-believers. In addition, we welcome that Netherlands will host the next round of the Istanbul process. We all have different cultures and belief systems, but we all share the same humanity. We believe that all human beings are endowed with certain universal rights, and we believe that human rights must be the same for everyone regardless of how we worship, where we worship, or indeed if we worship at all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I now give the floor to Morocco. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for hosting this second ministerial conference. The Kingdom of Morocco has always been strongly committed in favor of religious freedom and continues to make very every effort to promote peace through interfaith, dialogue, and tolerance. Considering the time allowed, two minutes, I will make focus on just five essential actions that was realized since our last meeting uh, in July 2018. First, the historical visit of His Holiness Pope Francis to Morocco last March highlighted Morocco's openness and ongoing efforts to promote peace through interfaith dialogue. On this occasion, the Al-Quds call was signed by His Majesty the King Mohammed VI, the commander of the faithful, and His Holiness Pope Francis, recognizing uh, Al-Quds Sharif as common heritage of humanity and calling for preserving the city as a symbol of peaceful coexistence. Second, the holding last September in phase of the second edition of the International Conference on the Dialogue of Cultures and Religions. This meeting was attended by participants from different countries, governments, NGOs, experts, and academics to promote society model based on the respect of culture and religious identities. Third, the third point is con in connection with education. 
the Mohammed VI Institute for Training of Imams and Muslim Pressures, was created in 2015 to pro in the, uh, of the, for the purpose of promoting interfaith dialogue and uh, to, to fight against radicalism and extremism. Until now, we have more than 4,300 foreign um, Muslim pressures, men and women, that was uh, trained in this institute coming from African and European countries. The first point is related to media. The, His Majesty the King Mohammed VI has recently launched the radio uh, broadcasting program, new programs, in order to, to enlighten people and protect them from uh, ignorance, but also from falsified interpretation of uh, the principles of Islam. The fifth point is related to uh, restoration of religious sites. His Majesty the King launches last April 2019 the construction of a museum of Jewish culture, and in the same spirit, he uh, granted financial subsidy as contribution to the renovation of some areas in Al Quds uh, Mosque. Uh, to conclude, I can just assure that Morocco continues to be concretely committed and we look forward to hosting the first regional conference on preserving of culture and the religious heritage by, in the coming months. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, just a word of note, uh, now that we've passed the foreign ministers, of, foreign ministers have spoken, we've recalibrated the clock. Uh, to a shorter time span, so we'd ask that you try to do your best to stay within that amount. We're doing, I want to congratulate everyone who has spoken for staying pretty close to the time that we've asked. Um, after Columbia speaks, the agenda did note lunch. So we're going to keep moving on because we're doing well with time, um, but now I give the floor to Columbia. Good afternoon, Your Excellencies. On behalf of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Colombia, I wish to present our appreciation to the government of the United States, to Secretary Pompeo and Ambassador Brownback for convening this second conference to advance religious freedom. As was established in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, every person has the right to the freedom of thought, of conscience, and of religion. They have the liberty to change their religion or beliefs and the liberty to express their religion and their beliefs individually or collectively, in public or in private, and to be taught, practiced, and observed. Other international human rights instruments also acknowledge and develop this right. The acknowledgement and respect for the liberty of thought, conscience, and religion is a fundamental element of a democratic society. Based on this premise, in Colombia, the acknowledgement of religious freedom and of cult is part of our constitutional tradition and was reaffirmed as a fundamental right in the Constitution of 1991. This has provided for significant advancements towards the promotion of individual and collective liberties related to religious beliefs, their plurality, diversity, and their practices. Colombia has a firm commitment to uphold human rights and to provide guarantees for all citizens to exercise their right to freedom of expression, practice their religious faith, or not profit any faith at all. As part of this commitment, in 2014, the Colombian government started working jointly with close to 4,000 religious leaders from different faiths and various parts of the country. This very productive participatory process concluded last year with the adoption of our public policy on religious freedom, which aims not only to guarantee the freedom of cult, but also to create conditions for the acknowledgement and strengthening of their social, cultural, and educational activities, as well as their important role in the construction of peace and reconciliation. Also in 2018, the Direction for Religious Affairs was created within the Colombian Ministry of the Interior. The implementation of our public policy and religious freedom constitutes a priority of President Ivan Duque's government, who convened religious leaders of all faiths last 4th of July to celebrate the National Day of Religious Freedom that was established by a presidential decree in 2016. President Duque took this opportunity to invite representatives of all beliefs and faiths to maintain a permanent and open dialogue with the government and continue advancing mechanisms to effectively uphold religious freedom in Colombia. Colombia welcomes the opportunity to participate in this ministerial meeting and is keen co to continue to join our efforts with partners to confront the challenges to religious freedom and promote its preservation. To this effect, my government wishes to extend an invitation to government authorities 
to religious leaders and civil society organizations to participate in the regional conference to advance religion freedom, religious freedom in Latin America and the Caribbean, we have offered to host in March 2020 in Bogota. Colombia will be very honored with your presence and participation. Many thanks. I now give the floor to Ukraine. No, I would like to speak after the lunch as it was supposed to be. Thank you. I'm sorry, say that again. I would like to speak right after the lunch of, as it was supposed to be on the program. I'm not ready to speak. Certainly, right. no problem. Then I'll give the floor to Croatia. Uh, sir, it's the same thing. The State Secretary is having a bilateral meeting. We thought that it would be after the lunch. We're, we're a victim of our success with moving through our speakers list. We'll keep moving down the list. Belarus. Thank you. Ambassador Brownback, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by thanking Secretary Pompeo for initiating the Ministerial to Advance Religious Freedom. As Belarus is invited for the first time, thank you for the invitation. We don't have to agree on everything to hold meaningful dialogue on human rights, including the unalienable human right of freedom of conscience. Being in the center of Europe and historically at the crossroads of various exchanges, trade, cultural, educational, and unfortunately, oftentimes, military campaigns, Belarus has developed to become religiously tolerant. Belarus and Christian Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches have been major parts of Belarusian society. It's not unusual to have two confessions represented in one family, flourishing in peace and harmony. We are a country in which Orthodox and Catholic Christmases, as well as Easter's, fall on different dates, but celebrated gladly by Belarusians regardless of religious affiliation. The road to the current state was winding. And now Belarus has returned, for example, to the Roman Catholic Church around 300 buildings that were taken before my country's independence. Tax incentives are in place, lower rates for renting properties available, as well as resources allocated for, by the government to repair and maintain places of worship and to educate clergy. A large group of Tartars settled in Belarus over 600 years ago, which historically made Islam an accepted and recognized part of Belarusian family of religious confessions. Because of the pale of settlement of the 18th till 20th century, which was a terrible anti-Semitic act, many Jews made Belarus their home. Belarusians and Jews lived as good neighbors and very often as family. So when the most trying times came, during the Nazis' occupation of my country, we were together too. More than 800 Belarusians have been awarded a title of righteous among the nations. Nowadays in Belarus, a country of less than 10 million people, there are 500 monuments dedicated to victims of Holocaust. Starting from 2013, we have been working with the U.S. Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad to put together information about Jewish cemeteries, synagogues, yeshivas that need reconstruction. Along with religious confessions that go back centuries in Belarusian history, new confessions with no historic roots in my country also find following among the population and support of the government. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is relatively new to Belarus and hasn't been officially registered yet, but I was honored to meet President Nelson in Minsk in 2017 and Elder Rasband just over a month ago. State's report on international religious freedom does include criticism and on Belarus. And again, we appreciate the possibility to be a part of this ministerial, as we also stand ready to continue our dialogue with the U.S. on human rights. Thank you. Thank you. Now here from Bulgaria, His Excellency George Jorvi, the Deputy Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you. Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, dear friends, allow me to express my sincere gratitude to the Department of State of the United States for organizing for a second consecutive time this event dedicated to the advance of religious freedoms. 
It is my great honor to address the participants of this high-level segment of the meeting that will provide a stimulating exchange of thoughts and good practices that will help us renew the determination to effectively promote a value of fundamental importance to all people around the world. The Republic of Bulgaria places great importance on upholding and protecting the freedom of religious and expression and welcomes all initiatives aimed at spreading these universal values worldwide. The 2018 Ministerial to Advance Religious Freedom in Washington resulted in the Potomac Declaration and Plan of Action, which offer excellent guidelines to ensure equal protection under the law regardless of religious affiliation or lack thereof. The Republic of Bulgaria has carefully examined the documents and is currently working on implementing its provisions. From a legal point of view, in December 2018, after discussion with competent institutions in Bulgaria, civil society, international organizations, including religious organizations, the Religious Denomination Act was amended to incorporate changes in the mechanism for public subsidies of the religious institutions in my country. Now religious denominations may also be funded from abroad even if they already receive a state subsidy. They are not obliged to declare their donations to the state. Additionally, all debts of registered religious denominations have been deferred in order to avoid any imp impediment of the exercise of citizens' freedom of religious and belief. Bulgaria supports the calls of the Potomac Plan of Action for encouraging the importance of diversity, tolerance and pluralism, as well as respect for everyone's right to freedom of religion and belief and the promotion of general understanding of world religions to reduce harmful misunderstandings and stereotypes. In October 2017, the Bulgarian government took a decision to adopt and apply the IRA definition on anti-Semitism and to appoint me as national coordinator on combating anti-Semitism. This decision of the Bulgarian government aims to further address the needs of the Jewish community with respect to their security and rights of religious freedom. Throughout our experience in the last two years in implementation of the provision of the Potomac Declaration in its plan of action, we are currently discussing the possibility to appoint a focal point on freedom of religion and belief on a senior level within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This effort is aimed to strengthen the capacity of the Bulgarian diplomatic service and the state as a whole to guarantee and defend freedom of religion and belief both within the country but also internationally. I am happy to say that many of the positive examples shared with you today are also noted within the annual report of the International Religious Freedom of the Department of State. Nevertheless, Bulgaria acknowledges all recommendations and examples of sporadic religious intolerance and discrimination in the country. The government and the relevant institutions are working closely with all part partners, including the US, in promoting all necessary measures for security and religious freedoms. Dear colleagues, to conclude, I would like to reiterate Bulgaria's strong support for the work of the State Department in the field of the implementation of the highest international standards aiming at promoting and protecting the freedom of religion and belief. Bulgaria remains committed to continue working jointly with all countries represented at this high-level meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll now hear from the United Kingdom, or Taki Ahmad. Uh, of Wimbledon, the, uh, well, my compatriot in this office, with, he's uh, Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion or Belief, Lord Ahmed. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's an honour to be amongst such a distinguished group of world leaders, all committed to the freedom of religion or belief. And may I firstly say I'm grateful to the United States for bringing us together, but in particular to Secretary Pompeo and to you, Ambassador Brownback. Sam, if I may, your partnership, your friendship is in, of incredible value and we look forward to strengthening that further. Your Excellencies, it is said in the innocence of a child, we find our most profound, profound answers. My little boy, Mansour, who's studying at a Jesuit Catholic school, asked me recently, Daddy, what kind of Muslim am I? I, being a politician, turned it round and asked Mansour, what kind of Muslim do you think I am? You are. He paused for a moment and with great poignancy, he said, Daddy, a Christian Muslim? Freedom of religion or belief has long been at the heart of UK foreign policy and diplomacy. That innocent remark of my own son demonstrates the strength of the country that I'm proud to represent, the strength of building relationships between communities of all faiths. In Sudan this year, we hosted a religious freedom conference in January. I am grateful to both our colleagues and friends from the United States and Canada, which ensured that we saw the Khartoum governorate, 
drop restrictions on the opening of Christian schools. We have also seen progress in Algeria. Over the past year, our ambassador has hosted meetings between Christians and Muslim leaders, and the space, the religious space for Christians, and indeed Amdi Muslims, has be become slightly better, but more needs to be done. Whilst we take pride in our achievements, there is so much more that needs to be done if real change is to be effected. And that is why our Foreign Secretary commissioned an independent review of the situation of persecuted Christ Christians. And I'm pleased to announce today that we have fully accepted the review's ambitious recommendations in full. These include making religious literacy compulsory for all our relevant diplomats a personal priority for me. We will also <coughs> work with parties to agree a Security Council resolution calling on governments in the Middle East and North Africa to ensure the protection and security of Christians and all faith minorities. In conclusion, Your Excellencies, as champions of freedom of religion or belief, all of us here recognize that it is a right that should be enjoyed by everyone, everyone, everywhere. Now is the time to be the voice to the voiceless millions of persecuted religious minority. Now is the moment right here, right now, for our collected commitment to build that world free of religious bigotry and hate. Now is the time to act. For our biggest challenge, Your Excellencies, is not when we stand up for our own rights and beliefs. The real test is when we stand up for the rights and beliefs of others. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Romania. <coughs> His Excellency Maria Magdala Grigor, the Secretary of State for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Romania. Thank you, Your Excellency. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a special privilege to address the second ministerial meeting to advance religion freedom. Allow me, first of all, to commend the State Department for so generously hosting this second ministerial meeting to advance religious freedom and to praise the department's constant commitment for human rights and democratic values. It is indeed an ambitious endeavor to bring together such a broad, broad and diverse range of stakeholders to identify concrete ways to combat religious persecution and discrimination and to assist in ensuring greater respect for freedom of religion or belief. I am pleased to note that international organizations with an extensive expertise in combating religious intolerance and hence vital in supporting such efforts are once again participants to this event. Ladies and gentlemen, religious freedom is a fundamental right. We must never forget it. Each religion shapes the culture of every nation. It gives the freedom of choice, dignity and meaning. I'm proud to say that Romania is and will always be a supporter and a promoter of freedom of religion and belief, as well as of the spirit of tolerance. Ethnic and religious diversity are sources of spiritual development, which enrich any culture or society. We have seen many times in the world we are living that people unconsciously created a limited mental map where the borders are closed as they cannot accept the beliefs of the others. We have to encourage and cultivate people's critical thinking. Too many times the world has witnessed how intolerance has destroyed life. That's why we firmly reject any form of intolerance and violence that is ethnically or religiously motivated. We are concerned by the increasing number of terrorist attacks that are directed against certain religious uh, denominations. The most affected are those of Christians, Muslim and Jewish confessions. Dear participants, if you underst understand each other, you will be kind to each other, said once um, John Steinbeck. It is as simple as that, even if it seems very complicated. The legal framework in Romania ensures the equality for all independent um, of their religious beliefs. The Constitution of Romania states the principle of non-discrimination on religious grounds and established the principle of freedom of thought, opinion, and religious beliefs. It guarantees the religious autonomy of the cults and their functioning according to their own statutes. But the state alone cannot meet all the needs of the society. It is in the best common interest to promote the development of a social partnership between the state and the religious denominations. 
The recent visit in Romania of Pope Francis confirmed the interconfessional harmony. It was an opportunity for us to show the solid relation between the state and the religion, religious denominations and the good ties between uh, the denominations in Romania. It demonstrated that we are capable of supporting a constructive inter-religious dialogue. Although we are mainly an Orthodox nation, we have showed that we understand that our truth is no different from that of others. Ladies and gentlemen, intolerance leads to hate. Hate uh, leads to chaos. Combating hate speech and extremism were top priority themes during our recent exercise of EU Council presidency, along with the combating of racism to intolerance, xenophobia, populism, and anti-Semitism. We understood that words lead to action almost every, um, every time. It is up to us to take the necessary measures to protect those who are the targets of hate speech and to eliminate violent extremist content. Incitements to violence or statements that are likely to create feelings of hatred against individuals, minorities or communities do not fall within the acceptable limits of freedom of expression and sadly violence linked to online hate speech has grown worldwide. Thus we must be aware that hate speech lead, leads to unconsequences in real life, not just in the realm of ideas. It reflects real human beings, our fellow citizens, and sometimes it affects real human beings, our fellow citizens, and sometimes encourages um, um, unacceptable acts um, of killing and even um, in injure. Hate speech also isolates citizens and creates rifts in the society that impair the normal function of a democracy. As people who cherish democracy, fundamental rights and peace, we must never forget that hate speech has accompanied some of the most horrible episodes in human history. It was a silent accomplice in a war, crimes, genocide and mass murder. In order to draw the attention to hate speech and extremism, the Romanian EU Council Presidency has organized three high-level events dedicated to the combating of anti-Semitism, all benefiting from the attendance Let's of the Prime up, Minister. Please. Just to um, close, um, well, thank you um, once again. Events like uh, these ministerial meetings hosted by the State Department and now becoming, uh, which is now becoming an annual tradition are important steps. So thank you once again for your invitation and wish you success in all the debates here. Thank you. Next here from the Republic of Korea, His Excellency Jung Silk Kang, the Deputy Minister for Multilateral and Global Affairs. Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by joining the previous speakers and expressing my sincere appreciation uh, to the United U.S. government and uh, Secretary of State Pompeo and uh, U. Ambassador Brian Beck for the, for the leadership in convening this important event. I am honored to be part of these efforts to protect and promote the right to the freedom of the religious around the world. The Universal Declaration of the Human Rights proclaims that everybody, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Although it has been uh, 71 years since its adoption, there is a huge gap between idea and reality. Acts of uh, restriction, discrimination, and violence based on religion continues in many parts of the world. The responsibility to ensure religious freedom and eradicate discrimination based on religion or faith rise first and foremost in governments. Governments, however, cannot address this issue alone. We should engage all key actors and stakeholders, including religious communities, civil societies, and academics. It is also crucial to 
raise awareness of the importance of diversity, tolerance, reconciliation, and the positive values such values have to society. The Republic of Korea guarantees freedom of religion for all citizens and the separation of the state and the religious organizations. My government is working hard to nurture a culture of respect and appreciation for diversity and to enhance interface mutual understanding. Religious freedom is an, uh, an in, 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 inalienable and fundamental human rights. Thus, defend the freedom of religion and belief is our collective responsibility. On this meaningful occasion, I'd like to reaffirm the Republic of Korea's full commitment to the right to the freedom of religion and the pledge to engage actively in the international approach to advance religious freedom worldwide. Thank you. We'll now hear from uh, Croatia, Zavadev Buskic, Deputy Minister of Foreign and European Affairs for the Republic of Croatia. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed uh, friends. I'm pleased and honored to participate once again uh, at this Religious Freedom Conference uh, on behalf of the Republic of Croatia, and I would like to thank Secretary Pompeo for his initiative and his commitment to maintain the issue of religious freedom highly on our agenda. I'm also glad that this year we are gathered even in a larger number than the last year, which confirms that the conference has been wide, widely recognized as an important contribution for strengthening mutual understanding and tolerance among different faiths in the world. We are all here to reaffirm our commitments for advocacy, promotion, and protection of freedom of religion and faith of all people, as well as to share our most effective per, uh, practice uh, in, uh, in, in ensuring religious freedom. Yet, we continuously witness intolerance, discrimination, prosecution, and violence against religious man, uh, minorities in various parts of the world, and we are often we often hear about uh, uh, ar uh, about countries where the situation of religious freedom even has worsened. While no relig religion is violent in its very essence, acts of all forms of oppression based on religious and identity and um, uh, aff affiliation to are too often done in the name of a religion of relig different religions. Croatia has a long-standing policy on building uh, tolerance among different religion and presence of different religious uh, religions. Croatia considers really a part of her richness and the richness of our society. Allow me to highlight the relationship with the Muslim community, which is small in numbers, but well integrated and respected in our society. It is one of the oldest Islamic community in Europe, and it was granted status of official relig uh, religion um, in Croatia 100 years ago. Uh, unfortunately, due, due to numerous terrorist attacks of various kinds uh, by the Islamic uh, extremists and radicals, we are all, all aware of a widely spread negative perception of Muslims in general. Croatia firmly believes and confirms uh, uh, its stance that terrorism should not be associated with any nationality, ethnicity, race, or religion. It poses a threat to all countries and to all peoples. On the other uh, issue, sh um, we should also mention today that uh, the re-emergence and spreading of anti-Semitism in some parts of the world is also present. Unfortunately, the mankind has not learned it, uh, its lesson from the uh, painful history. Croatia is committed to working actively, both nationally and internationally, in combating the Semitism, hate, uh, hate speech, intolerance, and discrimination in, in, uh, in all its forms. Mr. President, on the other hand, today we are faced with, um, uh, with uh, a very well known fact that uh, Christians are prosecuted. Some of our, uh, some, uh, and it's over 80% of the prosecution today is it, it's Christian. Uh, Christians, uh, Christians participate. Actually, Christians are prosecuted over 80% of today's prosecution. 
In our view, the role of education is very vital in countering anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Christianity, anti and Islamophobia in all its forms and intolerance or hatred. Through education system in our countries, we, sh uh, we should focus on teaching our young generation to foster mutual respect and understanding and to be capable of critical thinking and to, and to be provocative, actually proactive contributors to, to create more peaceful, tolerant and secure world. Croatia recognizes importance, especially the preventive role of education in the intolerant uh, and hatred. For a number of years, Croatian Ministry of Science and Education has been carrying out uh, and, um, and supporting actively activities in which uh, teachings are taught uh, to enhance their teaching and skills regarding all forms of discrimination. In conclusion, Mr. President, allow me to wish uh, all the success and fruitful conference, and I congratulate you once, um, once again to, for organizing this conference. Thank you. Now recognize Czechia, uh, His Excellency, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. Honorable Secretary, Ministers, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, I am very glad to address this ministerial to advance religious freedom on behalf of the Czech Republic. There are worrying signs that violations of right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion, intolerance and xenophobia are on the rise in our societies. As these violations often constitute early indicators of potential conflicts, it seems that the challenges are greater than ever. We concur in this respect with the gist of the statements of concern prepared by the host country. Defending human rights is at the core of the Czech foreign policy. We are determined to promote freedom of belief without distinction of any kind. Respecting the principles of equality and non-discrimination, our policy on religious freedom is guided by the overall human rights concept with 10 priority con countries. On top of these 10 countries, we continuously support local NGOs through quick impact projects in any country. So far, we have funded projects related to religious freedom, for example, in Myanmar, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Egypt or Cuba. Above that, our program of development cooperation and its numerous educational projects are based on respect for religious freedom. Situation of human rights defenders in specific countries such as Myanmar, Russia, China or the region of the Middle East and Northern Africa are also raised in our statements in multilateral human rights fora and bilateral contexts. Protecting freedom of expression or association and assembly is an essential value gained in democracies. On the other hand, there is a need to defend against those who exploit these rights by inciting hatred and violence, including on the grounds of religion. We traditionally support intercultural and interfaith dialogue through various conferences, such as the annual Prague Conference Forum 2000, or regular dialogue with countries of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. This autumn, we are planning to organize already the fourth conference, which should explore connections between intercultural dialogue and prevention of violence, discuss the main drivers of violent extremism, and observe potential similarities across different cases of violent acts, which might help us to identify some transferable lessons. We believe that enhancing understanding between different groups is crucial for overcoming both open and latent conflicts. We therefore call on all actors to come together and advocate for mutual understanding and respect and recognition of human rights. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. And I recognize Canada, the Reverend Dr. Robert Oliphant, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada. Thank you very much. And I begin by thanking you and the United States for hosting this important event. Since the ministerial meeting of last year, terrorist attacks reminded us that all sorts of people in the world are targeted before, because of their religion and their conviction. And sadness when Christchurch, Quebec, Colombo, Manchester, Pittsburgh and San Diego are invoked. We cannot afford to add another name to this list. As leaders, we must renounce division and champion inclusion and respect for diversity. Canada's approach to freedom of religion or belief is rooted and grounded in the universality, independence, and inter interconnectedness of human rights. It deeply informs, informs everything we do. 
At home, we are taking decisive action to foster a more inclusive society. Our parliament condemned Islamophobia and all forms of systemic racism, religious discrimination. We recently introduced a new anti-racism strategy, adopting the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism. We doubled the annual budget for security improvements to community and worship spaces. And in 2018, Canada resettled more refugees than any other country in the world, including thousands of victims of Daesh. These are some of our domestic steps, but we know that there's more to be done globally, and it's our opinion that we need to do this constantly, continually, together. After Christchurch, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said, we must, and I quote, cast a light on this hatred and on our unwillingness to call it out. As leaders, as privileged few with power and an audience, we have a responsibility to do something. This responsibility is not negotiable. We must unequivocally call out attacks, including those against Christians and Jews around the world, Baha'is in Yemen and Iran, Uyghurs and members of other religious minority groups in China, Yazidis in Iraq, Rohingya in Myanmar. This is why in 2015, Canada launched the International Contact Group on Freedom of Religion or Belief with a diverse cross-regional group of countries. And I want to thank the active participants in this group. Together, we will keep working and we'll keep producing concrete action. That is why we joined the Christchurch Call to Action and commend New Zealand, France, and other partners for this critical call. That is why with 21 other states, we raised concerns at the Human Rights Council over the arbitrary detention, widespread surveillance, and restrictions targeting Uyghur Muslims and other minorities in China. Les efforts de chacun d'entre nous sont The efforts of all of us are essential for the protection of uh, religion and conscience. We must act together. And must never accept normalization of hateful discourse. We must champion a positive vision of global peace, freedom, security for all, and mostly we must do that together. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Kuwait, His Excellency Nasser al Sabay of the Development International Cooperation Agency. And I would say that I'd like to offer the, my gratitude to the government of the United States for hosting this important conference to guarantee more uh, religious freedom uh, uh, all over the world. And uh, here, there is reassurance, international reassurance for respect of religions and to uh, translate the uh, uh, International Convention for Human Rights on its Article 18 that every person has the right of conviction, religion, and conscience to believe as he pleases and to believe uh, in whatever religion he or she chooses. And as uh, uh, agreed to by the Institute of uh, uh, Political and Religious Rights and as agreed to by the United Nations in 1966, humans have the right of conviction and faith. Late, your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the state of Kuwait is keen to promote the culture of peace and uh, dialogue among its cultures and religions and support the efforts of the United, state, United Nations to bridge uh, among its cultures and countries. There is no doubt that peace is an uh, entrenched culture in the state of Kuwait before the establishment of the modern state uh, most notably acceptance of the other and dialogue among us different religions and cultures. Our history has many stories of openness and interaction with different countries and peoples until the establishment of the state of Kuwait where the constitution of the state guarantees freedom of uh, practicing religion with complete security and safety. And on this basis, the state of Kuwait is the uh, place where more than 120 nationalities live and coexist from all over the world and they enjoy security and stability 
with mutual respect and dignity. My country grants great importance to reinforcing the culture of peace, uh, tolerance, and uh, moderation, and to work against extremism in all its form, and considers it a responsibility of all international organizations and countries to work together to study the roots of differences and to remedy it as necessary and to confront it in a unified manner. Finally, I hope that our conference today will reach conclusions and common uh, principles to respect religious freedoms in a framework and a framework for respecting these freedoms whether uh, while respecting the specificities of every religion and in a way that leads for stability and peace in the international community. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from France, His Excellency Jean Christopher Piaciel, is a uh, ambassador, advisor for religious affairs for the foreign ministry. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. France is deeply attached to freedom of religion and freedom of faith, which is guaranteed in our constitution in accordance with the international instruments. So we thank the United States for having been willing to organize this conference. This freedom must be understood as the right to have a religion or to not have a religion, to believe or not to believe, to change one's religion, and if you have a religion, to practice it freely according to the terms of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, freedom of religion, of belief is demanding, it's exclusive, it doesn't apply only to the believers, even less uh, to the believers of a single religion, but indeed to everyone. That is why I remind you that my country is deeply attached to themes of freedom of religion, freedom of conviction, enshrined in the international law. This fundamental freedom is indistinguishable for the other fundamental freedoms. Uh, we uh, cannot limit one of these freedoms on behalf of another, exclusively to the human rights are universal and independent. Uh, and yet, unfortunately, freedom of religion and freedom of faith is often trampled, uh, oftentimes very violently and cruelly. Men and women are objects of discrimination, humiliated, jailed, tortured, killed in the name of their faith or in the name of their opinions. Such facts are an offense to the ideals of the United States and a threat to peace. We cannot fail to act. Our first priority, therefore, must be to protect and to implement the conventional legal framework available to us. States must guarantee via laws, but also via the good operations of their courts, the implementation of these freedoms by allowing actual appeals in cases of failures. We must also guarantee the same citizenship for all, without distinction between religions or convictions. We must take all necessary measures to protect it against discrimination and fight against the prejudice and stereotypes. In this regard, France would like to reiterate our attachment to the United Nations process at the Human Rights Council uh, uh, and to the principle of universal periodic review. This uh, notion of freedom of religion can also be uh, in, committed by acts and terrorist groups. Uh, we must maintain our efforts to fight against the terrorism these uh, can be committed by particulars on behalf uh, in the name of traditions, prejudice. We must therefore emphasize on education to fight against all types of uh, prejudice and to train young people towards a spirit of tolerance and re mutual respect. Uh, you religious leaders themselves have great responsibilities. It's up to them to fight against uh, hate speech, against violence, especially when these acts are committed in the name of religion. They must uh, speak a language of peace tolerance of respect. That is why France is deeply attached to its dialogue with religious leaders, and we are uh, deeply attached to interconfessional dialogue. To conclude, I would like to talk about the Middle East, a region with which France has very special relationship of friendship and cooperation. This region has been the theater of very deep violations of freedom
in religion, uh, belief, recently. In September 2015, France had organized a, a ministerial conference for the protection of the, of the victims of victims of violence in the Middle East. The action plans for this conference remains a precious guide for action. I can announce today that France will organize in uh, the fall a new conference dedicated to going further by promoting in the Middle, uh, Middle East, with, which will be pluralistic, peaceful, to ensure that the conditions that allowed the success of the terrorist ideology cannot appear once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now hear from Sweden, Ambassador Per Joachim Bergström, the Special Envoy for Intercultural and Interfaith Dialogue. Thank you. Freedom of religion or belief is a universal human right for everyone and everywhere. But despite this, people are persecuted, displaced and murdered because of their religion. Religious sites are destroyed and buildings set ablaze. The list of violations against the human right of freedom of religion or belief could be made long, but we all know it too well. Promoting and protecting human rights for all is a cornerstone stone of Swedish foreign policy, as is the promotion of tolerance, dialogue, and non-discrimination. It is important to take a holistic approach to protect and promote all human rights, which are mutually reinforcing and complementary. When working with freedom of religion or belief, Sweden thinks it's important to simultaneously address issues such as gender discrimination and the uh, emancipation of women and girls, freedom of speech, rights for people living with disabilities and the LGBT community, to name only a few globally vulnerable communities. Religion must never be used as a weapon to attack or discriminate individuals and the dignity of all humans. Sweden is working actively bilaterally with individual countries and in multilateral contexts to strengthen respect for freedom of religion or belief and to promote a culture of dignity, dialogue and respect between religions and cultures based on human rights, democracy and the rule of law. Engaging with other um, um, governments in efforts to strengthen protection for human rights is a permanent item on our agenda. It is continuously important to review and report on developments, increase awareness, and hold perpetrators of abuse and of human rights violations to account. Also, our public human rights report fill the purpose of, um, of monitoring. Reinforcing civil society is an important step in strengthening human rights and the protection of religious minorities. This work also includes our extensive efforts to strengthen democracy and the rule of law around the world. As minorities often fall victim of terrorism and violent extremism, greater international cooperation is needed to prevent violent extremism and strengthen counter-terrorism efforts. Development cooperation is an essential part of Sweden's effort to strengthen human rights and prevent the, vi the violent extremism that often targets religious communities. Sweden has bilateral uh, development cooperation with Iraq, a regional strategy for the Syria crisis, and wider regional engagement in the Middle East and North Africa. Our support is based on a rights perspective with a special focus on vulnerable groups, including ethnic and religious minorities. Contributions and projects range from strengthening dem uh, democratic governance, peace building and mechanisms for protecting human rights to support civil society, education, and other basic social services. Thank you. Thank you. Now hear from Mongolia, the Office of Religious Freedom and Human Rights Group. Oh. Uh, good, 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 good afternoon. My name is Buren Barr. I'm the Ambassador at Large for Religious Freedom Affairs in Mongolia at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Mongolia, in the last 30 years, I've been promoting democracy and freedom of religion. And recently, we uh, went through the 2018 report on international religious freedom where 
Mongolia has been specifically mentioned. And there are some, at this, uh, in this report, uh, we have seen that some of the issues that has been raised in regard to religious freedom has been the registration issue, uh, registration of primarily religious institutions and organizations that are functioning in Mongolia. As you know, Mongolia in the last 30 years have been working to promote and streamline uh, laws and legislations in the country. Uh, and one of the latest examples is that in 1992, we adopted our new constitution and we are now working to amend and change the constitution of Mongolia according to the new requirements and demands of the country. The report says that the government officials continue to receive Buddhist leaders during Lunar New Year celebrations. But we must remember that Mongolia, in Mongo Mongolia, Buddhism is interwoven as a fabric of our culture and traditions. And so, uh, although Buddhism is not uh, declared as a state religion, it is given prominence in the country because of the cultural roots and the traditions that Buddhism holds in the country. Uh, I'll just try to give you some of the figures that we have been released recently in uh, June 13, 2019. Uh, in Mongolia, there are 306 temples and churches, of which 54.2% or 166 are Christian churches. 33.9% or 104 are Buddhist temples and monasteries. 2.2% or there are seven Catholic, uh, uh, Catholic churches. And 6.8% or there are 21 shamanistic uh, places of worship. As mentioned in the report on the religious freedom of Mongolia, uh, there are 55 uh, registrations pending, a uh, request for registration. This is because in 2005, we adopted, a, uh, actually we uh, passed uh, uh, rules and regulations on registration of uh, religious uh, institutions, uh, but which was uh, abrogated and a new uh, rules were introduced in 2018, but the parliament and the Minister of Justice upheld this, uh, uh, these rules and regulations, and they are yet to be uh, approved, as a result of which 55 religious organizations are uh, pending uh, registration for permission to carry out religious activities, of which there are seven Buddhist organizations, 47, 47 Christian organizations and one Islamic uh, institution. Uh, I think uh, in Mongolia, we have quite a good record of religious freedom. As you can see that Mongolia in the last 30 years and prior to that, uh, Buddhism was the predominant religion, but we can see that today there are 166 Christian churches compared to 104 Buddhist temples and monasteries. Um, tolerance of religion in Mongolia has been traditionally very strong. As you know, in the 13th century, during the reign of Genghis Khan, uh, different religions actually coexisted amongst themselves and there was no kind of a discrimination any, against any religion. It was only during the years of socialism, communism from 1921 to 1990, that even Buddhism, which is a predominant religion, was actually almost obliterated and destroyed in the country. But after 1990, religious freedom has become a well, kind of a very important landmark in Mongolia. And Great. the appointment of the ambassador large for religious freedom of affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs recently is a very important landmark in terms of promoting 
religious freedom in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Well, at this point, we'll stop the uh, first plenary session of the ministerial. We've had a very productive morning. We're, very, we're thrilled by the high turnout. I have to say I'm personally thrilled that we're very ahead of schedule on the speakers list, so that's good. Um, as we pre prepare to break for lunch, a few notes. We will have copies of the statements of concern with the countries that you, the, with the statements you have indicated you want to co-sign on the tables after lunch. So you can check to make sure it uh, reflects what you've indicated through email to our team. Also, it's not too late to sign, and we'll have an ability for you to check a box if you want to join one of these statements. We, we're really pleased with the uh, high level of interest in those, and we encourage others to join. Uh, for lunch, uh, heads of delegation plus one will be going up to the Benjamin Franklin room. Uh, that should have been communicated through your teams, and it's on your credentials. I'd ask that you go through door one when we break. Uh, for everyone else, you'll have a very good lunch in the tents. And just to help with uh, the movements, I'd ask others going to the tents go through door two. Um, for the lunch upstairs, we will have the acting chief of staff from the White House, Mick Mulvaney, speak, as well as hear from Pastor Brunson. Um, and then uh, we will have revised speakers list, just to kind of keep track of where we are at the information desk um, towards the end of the lunch break. Um, at that point, at 2.30, we'll ask everyone to be back in here by 2.30 so we can keep going and continue our uh, very positive discussion and engagement.